Thank you all of you for coming here tonight. We're very fortunate, as always, to have four great writers, uh, some of them from Baltimore, but not all of them. And we have uh, four writers whose names I can pronounce. Uh, Nikita Broadman, Earl Crown, Jim Meyer, and Brian McWilliams. Yay! Yay! And we also have a five minute break after two readers so that you can buy Brian McWilliams books. And anybody, and so you can talk to other writers. Anyway, our first writer is, uh, is Brian McWilliams. You make an announcement. What? You make an announcement. I'll do it at the intermission. Oh, okay. What announcement? I've got a Sheila Hetty talk, don't worry. Oh, there's a Sheila Hetty talk. <laughs> Yeah, after, uh, but now I'm confused. Okay, Brian McWilliams, and he's going to talk about, Ru I mean, Russian baths. And I have, you know, I had all these associations with Russian baths because I lived in Russia from about 1992 to 1995, and I associated them with getting shot or things like that but actually he's got some very nice stories about it. He's an American writer who reported extensively from Russia and the for former Soviet Union from 1996 to 2008. He was the Moscow-based correspondent for the U.S. weekly newspaper, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and has reported for numerous publications, big and small including the New York Times, Big Nature, Science, Newsweek, and Rolling Stone. He will be reading from With the Lights With Light Steam, a personal journey through the Russian baths. This is his first book. set a timer on myself uh, so I don't go over excessive. Anyway, uh, I'm very grateful to John and Deborah uh, for inviting me and including me this evening. And I'm not going to say too much. Um, I'll just say that the banya was my favorite thing uh, about living in Russia. And uh, whenever I went somewhere um, to report, I tried to, I also made time to seek out the best steam wherever I went. And so the book is part memoir, it's part travel writing, it's part um, journalism. And uh, so I'll just start, this, this will be the beginning. Um, it's a little PG rated, but I think it'll be okay. This is the beginning of the first chapter. Um, and I should just say there was an editor at one point, I used the word sparks in this, as in, you know, I felt sparks. And there was an editor once who said, well, maybe you should lose that because it sounds too cliched. And I decided to keep it, so if it sounds cliche to you, at least just know it was a conscious choice to keep it key cliche in my writing. Um, it begins, uh, my shoulder is beneath my, my pillow, or my forearm is beneath her pillow. I'm awake, alert, she's asleep, deeply. I can tell because I feel the dream she is dreaming, the swell of its heat between her lower back and my stomach. I breathe slow, intentional breaths to prolong the moment and capture the scent, her scent, from beneath the chestnut hairs piled loosely at her neck. I look past her bare shoulder, past the double-paned windows, toward the still tops of the birch trees, reflecting white moonlight in the dark blue of morning. She could be one of the ones, I think. She could be the last of the ones. I know it is not for me to question where and when people come into my life. But I wonder why Yulia has come into mind when I am on the cusp of going. Why are, we, why we are starting something in the same place I am ending almost everything. When she walked into the coffee house, while she stood in line after she sat down next to me at the only free table in the place, I felt sparks. I often feel electricity with women, but rarely sparks 
They seemed so unequivocal when they came, as if daring me to doubt something was there, something special. With Yulia, I do not let you know what that something is, and I do not even guess, for if living in Russia has taught me anything, it is not to look far beyond the moment. I got sparks, now I'm risking my heart to find out why. So far, things feel as right as her body, small and calm and certain against mine. I lift my arm from her hip and place it, fold it, on top of hers, as if to reassure her. She is sleeping. I did so, I realize, to reassure myself. The alarm clock sounds and I roll over, pick it up, shut it off. I roll back slowly, I move close, but our bodies no longer quite fit. The heat has gone away, has somehow gotten lost. Another alarm sounds and I roll over again, reach toward the floor, turn off the alarm on a second clock. I set two alarms because we fell asleep only a few hours ago, and today is Sunday. Most of Moscow sleeps in on Sundays, but I never do. I rise early to meet friends at a Russian bathhouse or banya. Even when it is dark and icy outdoors and indoors, a warm, light body is bowed against mine. I have been living in Moscow more than 11 years. One of the constants in my life has been the in in inconstancy of my relationships, the departures of friends and of lovers, Another has been the durability of my Sunday survival ritual. The Ruskaya Banya rejuvenates me, keeps me healthy. It quiets my mind when I think too much, when I allow myself to feel anxious about having entered my 40s without a stable career, a partner, a home. Some days the Banya is everything I need to feel good about the world after a week spent reporting on much that is not. Friends and I have been going to the same bathhouse for several years. We have tried, we think, every other bathhouse, public bathhouse in the Russian capital. Every single one. And while just about everything associated with the banya is subject to argument, this is not. For two hours on Sunday mornings, we luxuriate in the best steam in the city. Some go to church on Sundays. I go to the banya. Yulia is about to find that out. So that's how the first chapter begins. And I was going to read, I thought I, I think I'll have time for uh, three things. One's short and the other one's a, a smidgen longer. Um, one of the, historically, Russia, you know, in Russia, men and women steam together, um, nude, for centuries. And unlike a lot of other cultures where bath culture sort of had a sexual element, that you could find more than good steam wherever you went. <laughs> In Russia, historically, th that didn't happen. Uh, even Casanova went to Russia uh, and talked about basically how asexual the steam rooms were, even though everyone's nude. And so at one point it was outlawed uh, by Catherine the Great, and then of course under uh, Lenin, and, and especially under Stalin. But there were people who sort of fought that. They'd have a little, you know, in your family banya, you can do what you want, basically, you can steam together. But in public banyas, it was sort of uh, uh, prohibited. And, um, after the wall came, the Soviet, the wall collapsed, the Iron Curtain, uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there was a lot that rushed in from, from uh, outside, but it also was a rejuvenation of the co-ed bathing. And there was a banya I used to go to uh, about once a month, sometimes twice, and you had to go with a girl because, you know, they didn't want guys showing up to stare at all these new girls. But, uh, so the, the chapter begins, um, I'm there with a friend of mine, uh, Oksana, uh, and I just, um, I'm gonna pick up um, somewhere near the beginning. This is the second chapter. I arrived in Russia without a return ticket, without a place to live, without a job, without a knowledge of the language, and without any savings other than the 12 $100 bills in my money belt. I also arrived without an aim other than the rather amorphous desire to learn to live more in the moment. The move seemed potentially life-saving after nearly three years in Southern California where at times I literally felt as if I were hovering above my life. I had not known that Russians are hardwired to live for today, and at the times, no one truly knew what tomorrow would bring, would make it easy for someone accustomed to living in his head to live closer to his heart. Life was amplified, living was breathless. I was completely unknown to everybody except one person, 
close friend and editor at the city's primary English language newspaper, The Moscow Times. Otherwise, I felt anonymous and outside the lines, such as they were, lines everywhere were being redrawn. So when a reporter told the editor, my friend, and me about a banya where women and men steamed together, I was spellbound. I had visions of bacchanalia. These visions were not quite lascivious, but I will allow that they verged on the orgiastic. The editor spoke Russian. He called the guy in charge of the mixed bath the organizer of a fledgling association of nudists. The organizer told him, anyone can come, as long as he comes as part of a couple. A policy he intended to keep out men who simply wanted to stare at naked women. But we don't have girlfriends, the editor said. Couldn't we just come as reporters? For purposes of, like, deep background? Uh, fine, the organizer said. The next thing would be in a few days. I was excited, but, I, but also was nervous, for I was not a man at peace with his body. I almost always have been overweight, if not quite fat, even when I played sports, even when I did triathlons. Moreover, for some 20 years, I gained and lost weight prodigiously uh, because I overate compulsively. In fact, I gained more than 40 pounds during the first year of my first job at a big daily newspaper. I since had lost much of the weight, but it left stretch marks, red and spidery, above my hips. I could not yet speak Russian, but naked, I would be sharing with people the severity of my clashes with myself. I wore some of my scars on the outside. Then there was a dimension to my biology that was even more likely to, to stick out. After all, I had been to a banya with other men, but I had never been to a banya with women. What if I felt myself beginning to get an erection? How would I stop it? And if I could not stop it, how would I hide it? The editor did not ask the organizer these questions. <laughs> But if you read chapter two, you will get the answers. <laughs> it might not be self-referential, but you'll get the answers. Um, so basically, there are only five chapters in the book. They're rather long. They're episodes, anywhere from two hours to two to three hours to several days. And uh, one of the chapters, the very last one, uh, I travel to uh, a place that's in south central Russia called Chuvashia. It's along the Volga River. and. Um, there, a friend of a friend uh, found for me uh, what's called a black banya. And a black banya is the granddaddy of all banyas. It's basically, uh, it's black because, well, you'll find out actually. Um, and, but it's, it's basically the same if you were to roll back uh, Finnish saunas to their very, very origins. Basically, that's, they're almost, it's basically the same as a very ancient uh, Finnish sauna. So some of these exist in Russia, but it's, it's a real chore to find them. And, um, uh, that's something I sort of, uh, this has to do with the, the final chapter, and I'll read the beginning of that. We will be resting between steams, our hair wet, our skin flushed, our backs slumped against benches, our chests rising and falling with a slow, pleasant fatigue from swings in temperature, hot to cold to hot to cold. We will talk about our jobs and our loves. We will talk about ourselves, too, when we were able to see ourselves as independent from work or women. Sometimes we talk about what we were feeling, not emotions so much as the physical sensations common to our chosen bathhouse in Moscow. Was the steam dry enough, soft enough, light enough? Were our senses aroused more, say, by the aroma of beer with reassuring overtones of mustard, or that of wormwood with slashing accents of peppermint? Sometimes when the steam was just right, we would not talk at all. Great steam, like great art, has the power to bring on quiet. Such moments for me were rejuvenating confluence of communion with myself, with others, with the divine. Every so often, though, these spells of good feeling would be broken from other, by, from, by other bathers, by declarations from other bathers, always Russian, that what we were experiencing, in fact, was not special. You call this a banya? This isn't a banya. This isn't a banya. There's only one true banya, one true Russian banya, the black banya. The steam here is good. I won't dispute that. I won't, but you'll never know what steam truly is until you've steamed in a real Russian bio, banya, when you've steamed black style. Most of it was hearsay. I knew most Russians have seen the Yeti. More Russians have seen the Yeti than have steamed in black banyas. 
Black banyas are nearly extinct, they just barely exist. They are the truest link to the ancient Slavic steam baths of another millennium. Black banyas are black because they did not have chimneys. Literally, they are black. The ceiling and interior walls are caked with soot from smoke. I have never appreciated being ripped out of a moment by someone telling me there was a better moment elsewhere to be had. Over time, though, the remarks of other bathers caused the vision in my mind of a dingy, soot-encrusted black banya to shimmer with the enchanting sheen of myth. Over time, I came to regard my appreciation for the Russian cult of steam, a bit like Cicero regarding his, his, his history. Quote, not to know what happened before one was born is always to be a child. Knowledge and awareness are not peers of experience. Like the dismissive remarks of the other bathers, there are only so much hearsay. I decided to find a black bunny and to steam in it. So. <laughs> Thanks. I, you know, I, my eyes are getting worse. And I should have, you know, I have reading glasses, but they're only good if I kind of hold it here. And then, but holding it here, so I'm going to have to print these out in bigger fonts. But so I'm sorry I, I missed a few words there. But um, uh, that's it for me. Thanks a lot. Thank you.